Hey, I'm Shauna, and we have a lot of great things coming up at Gold Creek you won't want to miss out on, so here's what's going on. First up, we have Man Fest. This is this Thursday at Thomas Family Farms. This is for all you men and the boys five and up. Make sure you bring the kids, bring your guy friends. It's gonna be a blast. We have a guest speaker from the Bow Rack. His name is Wayne Endicott. We have live music. Hey, I'm Shauna, and we have a lot of great things coming up at Gold Creek you won't want to miss out on, so here's what's going on. First up, we have Man Fest. This is this Thursday at Thomas Family Farms. This is for all you men and the boys five and up. Make sure you bring the kids, bring your guy friends. It's going to be a blast. We have a guest speaker from the Bow Rack. His name is Wayne Endicott. We have live music, food, games, competitions, all sorts of stuff. You won't want to miss it, so make sure to grab your tickets at goldcreek.org. Again, that's this Thursday from 6 to 9. Don't miss out on ManFest. Up next, we have baptisms coming up. This is going to be on Father's Day, which is June 18th, and you won't want to miss it. If you are ready to get baptized and tell the world about your faith through baptism, make sure you go to goldcreek.org slash baptism and sign up. We would love to see you there and celebrate your faith journey with you. Incoming fourth and fifth graders, this one is for you. On June 16th, you won't want to miss Bridge Night Out. This is for all of our fourth and fifth graders at all of our campuses, and the event's going to be located at our Woodenville campus. Make sure you register at goldcreek.org for all of those fourth and fifth graders to have an absolute blast together at this fun event. Taste of Alpha is coming up on June 20th. This is for you if you have questions about faith or if you're wanting to know, how can I share my faith with other people? Alpha is a great program that gives you tons of tools with your journey with Jesus. And a great way to just get a little taste of it is to come to Taste of Alpha on the 20th. We have dinner and childcare provided. It's a one night experience just to give you a glimpse of what Alpha is all about. We hope to see you there. Make sure to register at goldcreek.org slash alpha. 
And that's what's happening at Gold Creek. All right, good morning, church. Come on, let's stand and worship together. And if y'all are online, sing along with us too.
we lift it up today. God, we need you. So God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. So rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
sing this new song this morning and I'm really excited about it because it's just a declaration of who our God is and this song declares the name Jehovah and I think sometimes when we hear that name or we hear that word uh, the first thing we think of is some people knocking on our doors but man the name of Jehovah all that means is that it just means God or the Lord is and a lot of times when we read this in the Bible it's associated with another name and it, it just kind of explains more about who God is and so this song has four names of God in it. It's Jehovah, and you'll see that it says Jehovah Nisis, which just means our Lord is protecting us. There's Jehovah Jireh, which means our Lord is our provider. There's Jehovah Rapha, which means our Lord is our healer. And then finally, there's Jehovah Shalom, which just means our Lord is our peace. And so that's, that's what the song just declares. It's just praise vertically to Jehovah, to our God, who is our peace, who is our provider, who is our protector. And today we're just going to lift that up. I'm going to teach you guys the chorus. You guys go with that this morning? That's how it goes. Call the name, call the name, call the name Jehovah. And all our praise, all our praise. All our praise belongs to Him. Pretty simple, right? Come on, we can sing it together. Call the name. And call the name. Call the name. Call the name. Jehovah. And all our praise. All our praise. All our praise belongs to Him. All right, you guys kind of got it. Come on, let's get it.
come on, this is our hope. He fights our battles. Jehovah Nisi's fights your 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 battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi's fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Shalom heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Hey. Jehovah Nisi's fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Call the name. So call the name. Call the name Jehovah in all our praise, oh, all our praise, in all our praise belongs to Him. To call the name, call the name, call the name Jehovah in all our Fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi's fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heals your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. God's praises. Hey, do me a favor. Take a moment. Turn around. Say hi to someone. Welcome them to church. Give them a high five, a handshake, and if you're online, leave something in the chat for us. Hey, welcome here to Gold Creek. Uh, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor here. If I did not meet you, uh, I would love to meet you after service. Uh, but the first thing I want to do this morning is invite all the guys uh, to ManFest. So ManFest is our yearly big men's event that we do with all of our other campuses. We actually do it down at Thomas Family Farms right in the middle of the valley. And uh, this is happening this Thursday. So this Thursday, we're doing it. We have a, a guest speaker coming in to speak. We have food trucks. We're doing a bunch of giveaways. We're giving away a bunch of kid bows, bows and arrows, and an adult bow and arrow, a bunch of them, because the guest speaker we have coming in is a professional bow hunter, and he owns a bow, a bow shop. So we're going to have a lot of fun in that. We're giving away plane rides and all these different things. Uh, but the reason why we do this specifically 
is we want to create an event for dads and sons. And so what we're doing, like we did last year, is we want to give all the dads to have an opportunity. Don't just come by yourself. Bring a son or somebody else's son if maybe they need to be invited. Or this is a great invitation event for maybe you got a friend who you're trying to get to church. Uh, have him come with his son as well with you. And it provides a really great opportunity of getting your foot in the door. And we really want to have a lot of fun as guys when we're doing it. So if you're a guy here this morning, make sure you can sign up um, on the ta- on each one of your chairs. There's a ManFest card with a QR code. You can sign yourself up, anybody else up as well when you're doing that. The other thing is uh, this uh, today, right after this service, we're doing Discover Lunch. And Pastor Mike is, is speaking today, and it's going to allow me to actually be a part of all of Discover Lunch. And what Discover Lunch is, is if you're new, brand new today, or maybe you're new-ish, or maybe you've been around for a while and you've never gone to a Discover Lunch, it's a lunch where we provide free food, we got child care for you taken care of, where we just want to get to know you, we don't want anything from you, there's no timeshare spiel. Uh, we're going to tell you a, a little bit about us, we want to know a little bit about you. It gives you an opportunity to figure out who's Gold Creek. Um, do I want to be a part of this place? Uh, you know, you can ask any questions without any of the obligations behind it. So it's just free lunch at the very least with, with some free child care. So if you're brand new today, you can come. If you haven't signed up today, you can still come. Uh, all you have to do is just show up right after this service right here. You'll see a bunch of tables set up and we would love to have you. Good morning. My name is Jacob and I serve on our production team at our Woodenville campus. One of my favorite reasons for serving with the production team is being able to see everybody worshiping um, and being able to use what I can do uh, to worship God through that. If it's your first time joining us or you just haven't had a chance to connect with us yet, we'd love to get to know you and give you a welcome gift. Text welcome to the number that you see on the screen and let us know that you're here. If you're online, we'll mail you a gift. And if you're in person, meet us in the lobby and we'd love to give you a gift. Do you feel connected? (laughs) Have you found your people at Gold Creek? To see all of our connection opportunities, check out our connect page at goldcreek.org. To stay up to date on everything Gold Creek, make sure you follow us on social media. I'm Jacob, and if you see me around, I'd love to meet you. Make sure you say hi. The message is about to begin. Well, good morning again. If I haven't met you, my name's Alex. I'm the one of the, the worship pastors here, or, or the worship pastor here. Um, and I'm so glad that you guys are with us today. I want to tell you guys a little bit of a story about myself. Um, I, I didn't grow up in church, but the church that I started attending when I was in high school in, uh, in California, at the time I uh, graduated high school, I was super involved in the worship team. I was doing all the things, really involved in the church, really on fire for God. And I remember I got my first job, and I remember also sitting in a service very similar to this. Uh, the church that I grew up in or that I was at before, it was very similar to Gold Creek, right? Multiple campuses, they had the lights, they had the stage, the speakers, and all the things happening every week. And I remember sitting in a service just like this, and when this time of the service would happen, uh, there would be a pastor or someone on staff would walk on stage, he would give a little spiel and tell a story like I'm doing now, and then be like, hey, you should give money to the church because we need it. And I remember thinking at that time, like, man, like, I'm working at Starbucks making minimum wage. Like, God doesn't need my money. Like, 10% of, like, nothing is still nothing. Um, so it's like, what's the point? And I just remember wrestling with that, man, and just seeing, like, that church doesn't need my money either. Like, they got lights. They got all the things. They're fine. They're doing great. And I remember later on in my, my walk with God that God kind of put this on my heart. And there's this verse I want to read to you. It comes out of Malachi uh, 3.10. And it says this, bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, the Lord says. See if I will not open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings beyond measure. And like, come on. I don't know about you guys, but I'm the type of person that likes to like, poke at people like my wife knows like I like to get on her nerves or like I like to be challenged if someone put the challenge in my way I'm like all right challenge accepted like the creator of the universe says test me in this and see what I'll do and so when I saw that I was like all right God challenge accepted I'm gonna I'm gonna test you I'm gonna give you 10% of my income and see what you do with it because it says that you're gonna open up the floodgates with blessings And I'll be here to first to tell you that I did not get a Lamborghini or a nice mansion. I drive a 2002 Camry. But, man, God has blessed me in so many different ways. Right? The song that we sang talks about Jehovah Jireh, our God being our provider. He has provided for us. Right now, I got two little girls, a house. I'm married to my wife, obviously. And 
I went to the store the other day, and I was, there was like $9 for eggs. Like, come on. I'm like, and now I, I got to get to the church, and I got to do all these things. Like, God, come on. Like, $9 for eggs? Like, that's, that's, that's too much. Like, I can't do this. And that verse came to me again. And that's like, test me and see what I'll do. And so this morning, church, I just want to challenge you, maybe help take this, the step of faith with you of like just leaning into God and saying, all right, God, I'm going to test you. Because your word says this, and if you go by your word, then this is going to this is going to happen. And so I want to pray over you, over you today. And as you consider to give, there's ways to do it here on the on the back screen. But man, test God and see what He does, because He loves to show up. He loves to show off, and I can see Him doing amazing things in your life, like He's done for me. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you that you're so good that we can trust in you. That you always provide what we need when we need it, Lord. God, we trust in you. We love you. We pray for everything in the rest of the service in your name. Amen. Point. Good morning, Gold Creek. You guys doing well this morning? Okay, a couple people. The happy people are in the sunshine, so there we go. Hey, I just want to welcome you. My name is Mike. I am the high school pastor here. If you're joining us here in person or if you're joining us online, just so glad you've joined us today. I'm excited because we are in a series titled Fighting Words, Fighting Words, where we've been talking about all of the words that we say, whether it's to other people, the words that we hear was last week and how we internalize them and all that kind of stuff. And then today, specifically, we're going to be talking all about self talk? How do we speak to ourselves? What is that internal dialogue that we all deal with on a regular basis? And as I was prepping for this message, it reminded me about a time when I was 16 years old and I had just gotten my license. How many of you guys remember 16 and getting your license? Handful of people remember that. Okay. Um, How did you guys get here today? Um, No, 16, you first get your license. It's the first time you have real freedom, right? I had a 2003 Chevy Suburban. It was sick. I had two 12-inch subwoofers in the back, made all the neighbors mad, but it was amazing, okay? And I remember during that time, it was actually a pretty good time in my life. I was attending church regularly. I was serving. I was doing everything a good Christian kid should do, you know? Um, And I was on my way to church one morning about 5.30 in the morning, and I stopped at Starbucks because I was tired, got a bagel and a coffee, Okay, I was really excited about my coffee. I was feeling cool. I was drinking just a black coffee. I felt like I was awesome, you know, no sugar. I was feeling tough. And I get my coffee and I start driving to church, all right? And I'm driving and there's this stop sign coming up. It's about a 35 mile an hour road, stop sign coming up. I'm probably going 40, maybe 45, I'll be honest. And I see that stop sign. This little voice in my head goes, no one's on the road. Just cruise right through that stop sign. And Mike goes, that sounds like a really good idea. And so I just keep on going. I didn't slow down at all, just 40, 45, right through the stop sign. And immediately when I get through, I see these lights start flashing behind me. Get pulled over. The cop goes, do you know why I pulled you over? I'm like, we both know. why." Like, I didn't even try. I didn't even try to stop. And the cop looks over and sees my coffee and my bagel. And he goes, had time to stop at Starbucks, but not the stop sign. And I'm like, I'm like, dude. We get it. Just give me the ticket. We'll be fine. It was $141. I remember it to this day. You see, we all have moments where we have self-talk that either gets us in trouble or honestly sometimes just gets us in kind of a dark place. We all have an internal dialogue that we are always listening to. I don't know what that is for you, but I think sometimes for me it's, man, you're not a good enough father. How are you going to continue to provide for your family as your kids get older and life is going to get more expensive and there's this internal kind of soundtrack that we just hear constantly that is tearing us down in a way that says, man, you've gone too far. You've made too many mistakes. And it's this voice inside of our heads that we listen to saying, man, you're not enough. 
So this morning, I'm excited to preach a message titled, Getting Out of My Head. Because I think all of us in this room can relate. There's times where we just feel like we're stuck in our own thoughts. What I really want to talk about this morning is how do we identify how we introduce toxic self-talk, but also later on in the message, I'm going to talk about how do we fight toxic self-talk. And so first, I want to talk about how we introduce it. So we're going to be talking out of a story out of the book of 2 Samuel this morning where King Saul is over the nation of Israel. He is in power, and there's about to be a transition of power from Saul to David. So David was the guy that slayed Goliath with the stone, the shepherd's boy. God is raising him up to become the king of Israel. And during that time, he started working for Saul. And Saul started putting him in charge of armies, and he was going to all these battles, and he was starting to have success. He was winning, he was conquering, he was doing all of these things. But because of his success, David started to get a lot of recognition. People in the nation started to celebrate this guy, David, and Saul didn't, didn't like that. He started getting frustrated. He started getting jealous. He started kind of hating David because he was having success, getting to the point where he actually wanted to kill David. And so this morning when we talk about introducing self-talk, the first thing that we do, that we introduce toxic self-talk, is we downgrade our worth. And we see this in this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says this, it says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain thousands and David ten thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with ten thousands, he thought, but me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? See, in that passage, we get a glimpse into Saul's internal dialogue. He starts looking at the success that David is having, and he begins to downgrade his worth because of the success of somebody else. See, what happened here is he introduced the self-talk of comparison. Where he began to look at the people around him, he began to look at David's success and think somehow that nullified his success. That nullified his power. That somebody was trying to take over. And I don't know about you, I think sometimes for me it's looking at the people around us and being like, why did they get the promotion? Why did they get the raise? Why did they get invited into that meeting but I didn't? How how can they afford the new car or the new house? Or their family looks perfect on the outside and for me I feel like I'm just trying to hold it all together. We allow the voice of comparison to creep in. And what we end up doing is we end up downgrading our worth. You see, Saul in this moment was jealous. He wanted David dead. He put him in charge of even more armies, thinking that the Philistines, the people that they were battling, would eventually just take care of David for him. But David keeps on winning. He keeps on being successful. Our story continues in verse 20 through 21. It says this, In the meantime, Saul's daughter, Michal, had fallen in love with David, and Saul was delighted when he heard about it. Here's another chance to see him killed by the Philistines. Saul said to himself, but to have, or sorry, to David, he said, Today you have a second chance to become my son-in-law. He thinks, If I allow David to marry my daughter, surely my daughter will allow me to kill David. See, the second thing we do to introduce toxic self-talk is we lack accountability. You see, Saul was all alone in his thoughts. He had worked up this idea that David wanted him dead, wanted to take over his throne and make Saul look bad, and he convinced himself that there was this huge problem. See, just recently about... About 50 days ago, one of the people I work with introduced me to this thing called 75 Hard. If you've heard of it, it's this like workout, diet thing. 
I don't know why I said yes, but we're on day 49 of this 75-day hard. You have to do a couple workouts, got to drink a gallon of water, got to read, got to follow a diet, all these things. It's great and terrible at the same time. And one thing I have realized in these 75 days is that I am so, so, so good at convincing myself of absolutely anything. I get to this point, I'm at day 49 right now, and all I want is a sandwich from Jersey Mike's. That's all I want. If you're a Jimmy John's person and you think it's better, you're wrong. I just wanna let you know, it's all about Jersey Mike's, Mike's way with the salt and the pepper and all the oils, it's great. That's all I want. I'm like, it's been 49 days. I haven't cheated once. I followed all of the rules. I can have a sandwich. It's not that big of a deal. I'm not asking for a donut. I'm asking for a sandwich. I'm really good at convincing myself of anything. I haven't done that yet. But another thing that happened about, you know, about three weeks ago, I tried to convince myself of something else. My wife went on vacation with her mom. They went down to Waco, Texas. They did the whole Magnolia thing. She left me at home with the girls, okay? Two toddlers, two and a half, and one year old. And I'm at home, and I was in the middle of a time where work was kind of stressful, things were kind of hard, I was, I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed, like, you know, you're kind of like swimming with your head just a little bit above water, and I was feeling overwhelmed, and then I have my kids with me, and my wife's gone, and she's amazing, she does more work than I do with my children, and so she's the best. And so I was feeling stressed out, okay, so I started thinking, I'm like, I need to find a way out of this thing. Um, not like literally, like I'm not like looking at a way to run away from my family, I'm not saying that. But when my wife got back, I said, babe, I got this amazing idea. I said, I found this property. It's in Oklahoma. It's on 40 acres, beautiful house. It's only $250,000. Got a job I could work online. All we got to do is sell everything and leave and get out of here. And she looked at me and she said, that's not happening. You see, The reason why I had gotten myself to the point where I was ready to move to the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma is because I was alone in my own thoughts. I had no one around me keeping me accountable. I was sitting there focused so much on the problems, the stress of life, the worries that I had, and all I wanted to do was to find a way to escape. But here's the thing. When we try to escape all of those things, we bring all of our stuff with us because it comes from us. It's not because of where we are, it comes from us. See, when we lack accountability, we don't have anybody to point those things out for us. See, the third thing we do to introduce it to our lives is we believe the lie. So it starts with that internal dialogue, that voice of comparison. Then we don't have any accountability and no one's speaking into our lives. And then we get ourselves to this point where we're planning a trip not a trip, a whole entire move to Oklahoma because no one is speaking into our lives. We begin to believe it, like this is going to happen. I'm on Indeed. I'm like, I got a job already lined up online. Brian, I'm not leaving, just so you know. (laughs) We're good. We're here. She said no. My wife's in charge. We know this. You see, but when we begin to believe the lie, we start to live out of that lie. We begin to make decisions based on the lie that we have created. The story in 1 Samuel continues in chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. It says this, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse, that's David, lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me. He must die. See, Saul was so caught up. He thought that people were out to get him. He tried to get Jonathan, his son, to help him kill David, which they were best friends. So David helped, or Jonathan helped out David. And Saul's so frustrated. He says, bring someone to me. I need to kill David. He had this own internal dialogue. He started to believe the lie, and we see where it led him. I think one of the ways that we do this a lot is when someone texts you with no context, and they're just like, hey, can we talk? You start racking your brain. You're like, what do we need to talk about? You know what I mean? I'm the type of person, just so you know, if you do text me that, I'm calling you immediately. And I will keep blowing your phone up until you answer, because I can't, I don't want to deal with that. 
You see, in those moments, we start racking our brain, trying to figure out everything that's going. We second guess the last conversation we had with them over, like, did I say something wrong? Did I, did I not say something I should have? And we develop this whole story in our head and start to stress ourselves out over something that doesn't even really exist. I remember when I first started in ministry, uh, somebody told me, they said, hey, Mike, just so you know, I know you're a pretty confident person, but I just want to let you know, no one is at home thinking about you. And I was like, okay, th- why? <laughs> um, and I say all that to say, like, I think sometimes we get so worked up that people are frustrated with us, or people are judging us, or people think what we said was hurtful, and we start to second guess and create this, this narrative in our head that we messed up somehow, We start to talk negatively about ourselves, and what we need to realize is that people aren't at home just thinking about you. They're at home thinking about themselves and their own problems. And the moment I realized that, it was honestly kind of freeing, because then I didn't have to sit at home and worry about all the terrible things I said, because I say a lot of dumb stuff all the time. You see, we introduce toxic self-talk in so many different ways. But the real question is, how do we begin to fight toxic self-talk? Because we all know it's there. We all know that there's things in our lives, there's dialogues in our head that get us into dark places or unhealthy patterns of thought. How do we fight toxic self-talk? The first thing that we do is we find ways to recharge with God. You see, we have to find ways to recharge with God. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm the type of person that is like go, go, go all the time. It's been this way my whole entire life. When I was about 11 years old, we had a baseball tournament. I grew up in Puyallup, Washington. We had a baseball tournament down in Chino Hills, California. So my parents pack us up in the Suburban, the 2003 Suburban that I got when I was 16, super sick. No subwoofers at this time. Um, but I'm in the middle row driving down 17 straight hours to Chino Hills, California. And my parents will attest to, th- attest to this. For 17 straight hours, I sat there and just talked the whole entire time. Is there anybody like that in here? Like you're the talker? Anybody have kids in here that they are the talker? Yeah, we know. We know. We got them in youth ministry. It's okay. We love them. You see, we all have people in our lives, whether it's ourselves or others that are go, go, go all the time. I I don't rest very well. If it's not work, it's a personal thing that I'm working on at home, or if it's not something physical that I'm doing, it's my mind just constantly going and going and going. I don't rest well. I need to find ways to recharge with God. Psalm chapter 18, verse six, it says this. In my distress, I called to the Lord, I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. In this passage, you have David, not Saul, knowing how to recharge with God. He found ways to recharge. He went to God. How many of you love to go on vacation? You guys love a good vacation? How many of you are like beach people, like you're going tropical? Come on. Any, any road trip, like woods, camping type of people? Okay, that's good. Pastor Brian, we know. Um, I love a vacation. It's amazing. Feels great. It's restful, right? You get to have a good time. You got to kind of leave some of the responsibilities back home. But how many of you have ever came back from a vacation and been like, I just need like two more days? Anybody felt that? Yeah. Like you came back from vacation and you're somehow still tired, right? See, we've all been there. The reason why is because true rest is not found in a vacation, it's not found in a nap, it's not found in laying out by the pool or a margarita at the beach, although those things are great, they are not the things that are going to recharge us. They are not the things that are going to fill us up. What David didn't do was completely disconnect from everything. He didn't completely disconnect from the world to get rest. What he did was he reconnected to the source that will ultimately bring rest. See, even Jesus did this in Mark chapter 6. It says this, Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
I don't know where you're at in this room, but one thing I do know is that you're not invincible. No matter how much capacity you have to take on more, to take on more responsibility, to try to accomplish and to continue to climb the ladder, to provide for yourself and for your family, at some point you're going to need to rest. Even Jesus spent time with his father. Even Jesus spent time to recharge with God. We need to find ways to recharge with God. For me, lately, doing this whole 75 hard thing, I have to do two workouts a day, one has to be outside, and I've just been doing a 45-minute walk almost every single day in the evening. And for me, this has been an amazing time for me to recharge because it's a moment for me where I can spend time with God in prayer, spend time with God in worship, Other ways, you can spend time reading God's word. The only way that you're going to know that God is speaking to you and how he's trying to direct your life is if you actually read the words that he's already written down for us. You see, we have to reconnect to the source. We have to allow him to be the one that fills us up. The second thing that we need to do is spend time with other believers. We need accountability. No one in this room is the best version of themselves when they're completely by themselves, myself included. When I am by myself, I know I am the worst version of myself. You see, Saul, in the story that we were reading, lacked accountability. He had no one around him to speak into the internal dialogue going into his head and into his heart. 2 Samuel, it says this in chapter 12, just a short verse. It says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. This is after David had a huge failure, and he sends Nathan to go and convict or rebuke David for the things that he was doing. You say he needed somebody to be able to speak into his life. That way he's not planning a whole entire move with his family to Oklahoma. See, he needed somebody to be able to speak into his things. Romans chapter 1, verse 12, it says this. This is Paul writing to a church. He says, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith. But I also want to be encouraged by your faith. Like I was saying earlier, I know that by myself, I'm the worst version of myself. I was talking earlier about how when you're 16, you feel like it's the first time you really get any responsibility or freedom. But for me, really, when you really get some freedom is when you go off to college for your first year. You're away from your family. You're away from your friends. For me, I was a baseball player. I didn't have a church I was connected to. I didn't have any Christians that were speaking into my life, that were like-minded, trying to encourage me. And I found myself in a place where I had spiraled my whole entire life out of control because of decisions that I had made. Because I didn't put people in my life that could encourage, that could challenge, that could call me to the better version of myself that God was calling me to. You see, this is why we as a church, we talk about connect groups all the time. It's why we did Take It for a Spin Sunday, and we're trying to get people connected to serving here at the church. It's not because we just want more people serving or more people in connect groups. We know as a church that when you do life with other people, when you spend time with people that are like-minded, that can encourage you, but can also challenge you when you're doing things you know you shouldn't be doing, that's when you begin to experience life to the fullest, like Jesus talks about. So the ways that we recharge, or the ways that we fight toxic self-talk is we recharge with God, we find accountability, we have people in our lives, spend time with other believers, and then the last thing we do is we focus on the truth about us. You have to focus on the truth about you. Last week we talked about the words that we hear. So often we listen to the wrong voices. It's the music we listen to, the movies that we watch, the people that we talk to, that it ends up informing the way that we end up talking about ourselves. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what your internal dialogue is. I don't know what that soundtrack to your life is, that you're the only one that hears. But I know for me, a lot of times it's tearing me down, saying you're not good enough. You're not a good enough dad. You're not going to be able to provide for your family. Can you sustain this? For me, my internal dialogue a lot of times is tearing me apart. I don't listen to what God says about me. I listen to what the world is saying about me and then the thoughts that go through my head. And 
Psalm chapter 139, it says this. It says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. You see, so often in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of life, we forget what God has said about us. Our thoughts are tearing us down when God is saying, man, his thoughts are precious. The precious thoughts he has about us, they cannot be numbered. You see, and what the enemy tries to do is the enemy in the midst of your life tries to sow these seeds of shame into your life. Where you start thinking about your mistakes, you're like, man, I I know I'm not enough because I know my mistakes. And there's no hope in shame. See, if you're sitting here in this room and your internal dialogue is constantly negative, it's constantly tearing you down, here's what I need you to know this morning, is that shame is not from God. You see, there's a difference between shame and conviction. Shame continually tears you down. Shame continually says you're not enough, where conviction says, yeah, sure, there's some things you need to work on in your life. God says, yeah, I know that there's mistakes that you've made, but on the other end of conviction is hope for a future. See, this life that you live, you're not meant to do it alone. God speaks to us in a way that is able to lift us up and challenge us to be better. See, Ephesians chapter 2 says this. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. As I was prepping for this message, I was thinking about just Sunday morning and who might be in the room. And I just feel like there might be a handful of people in this room that just need to hear this morning. You are God's masterpiece. I don't care where you've been, what you've done, you are God's masterpiece. And right now, in your head, all of the thoughts of your mistakes are popping up. Yeah, but what about my failures? What about my shortcomings? What about the times I haven't been honest? What about the sin that I'm in right now? You are God's masterpiece. And this passage says... That as a follower of Jesus, you have been made new. So why are we so focused on our past? Why do we get so caught up thinking about the mistakes that we've made? Whether they're years ago or two weeks ago or maybe this morning. Why do we get so caught up? We are God's masterpiece. Created anew in Christ Jesus. You see, the moment that everything changed for me was the moment I was able to say, I am valuable because God sees value in me. I don't know about you, but for me, I don't see the value in myself a lot of times. And it's hard for me to say, I am valuable because God sees value in me. Because most of the time, the voice is tearing me down. And I have to have the courage to say I am valuable, not because I deserve it, not because I am perfect, but because God sees value in me. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. See, Romans chapter five, verse eight, it says this. It says, God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That passage doesn't say once you clean your life up, That passage doesn't say once you confess that one sin. The passage doesn't say once you, you know, just clean it up a little bit on the outside. No, it says while you were still sinning, Christ died for you. So no matter where you're at in this room this morning, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what that internal dialogue in your head is right now, God sees value in you. And he proves that by what he did on the cross for your sins. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is he didn't just die on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose again on the third day to conquer those sins so we don't have to live in the midst of it for the rest of our life. And so wherever you're at this morning, I I feel like there might be a couple people in this room that are wrestling with faith. 
that are saying, I, I don't know what I believe about this guy, Jesus. If that's you this morning, I just want you to know you don't have to do this thing called life alone. You're not meant to do this thing called life alone. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that you could have freedom from all of those things that you feel captivated by. To the person in this room that's already walking with Jesus, think about your internal dialogue. What does it look like for you to say, I'm gonna believe that there is value in my life because of what Jesus did for me on the cross? I wanna provide an opportunity in a moment when we pray for those of you that are wrestling with faith, or maybe you're not, maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you just need to redirect your thoughts to what God says about you. So I wanna provide an opportunity for us when we pray. Would you guys bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. God, I pray right now for the person in this moment that is hearing the thoughts of shame in their head. God, I pray in the powerful name of Jesus that you would remove those to the person that is wrestling with faith that goes, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of doing life alone. It's too hard. I feel like I'm barely keeping my head above water. And to that person, just pray right now that you would open up their hearts to you and they would say yes to you and what your son Jesus did on the cross for them. God, I pray that we would leave this morning different. God, I pray that we would leave this morning changed for the good. I thank you for what you did on the cross for us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Only stand and sing with us this morning. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Yeah. Oh, sing, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love.
out the most for me when Mike was uh, talking about self-talk is uh, we become our own worst enemies when we're alone. And I want to encourage you, if this is your first time today or if you come regularly, this is the best thing you can do is show up to church with like-minded people. We're all in this together and nobody's perfect, but we're all trying to go the same direction. And I want to encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. Keep showing up. Keep taking these spiritual steps, although sometimes they might feel uncomfortable. It's the right thing to do. Uh, one of the things, too, is that if you prayed with Mike this morning and you needed to, you know, let this be the morning that you said, I'm going to commit my life to Jesus or I'm recommitting my life to God today, uh, we always want to provide a place and an easy way to do it confidentially to say yes. And inside of your program, there's a place in a QR code that says, I said yes. And this allows you to midweek, on your way home, whatever it is, you can scan the QR code and just say yes. Because again, you're not supposed to do life and faith alone. We want to walk with you through that process. You can do that anytime. Uh, would you guys just bow your heads and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are so thankful. Thankful for um, all you have done. Thankful for the fact that you walk with us, you provide community to be with us. And you speak life into our mind, into our thoughts, and in our life. We love you, and we're so thankful for you. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Uh, just b before you go out, just a reminder, right now is Discover class. We would love for you to be our guest. Come eat some lunch with us. We love you guys. See you next week. You're dismissed.